Good evening to you. My name is Regan Beans. Thank you for joining us on From the South. Here are this evening's headlines. Venezuela's Maduro reveals a plot to cut the power during December's elections. Chanting, Vale, you killed me, Brazilians blame the mining companies for the mudslide deaths. And one leader believes that World War III is on the horizon. The details on these stories and more, now on From the South. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro has accused the right-wing opposition of orchestrating plans for a national blackout ahead of parliamentary elections next month. The head of state made the accusation during a press conference from the Miraflores Palace. He further revealed that several people had died while attempting to cut electrical wiring. Media outlets are hiding what's happening because we have discovered this sabotage plan against our electricity system during elections. And I'm de-announcing this. They have a plan to generate a national blackout. What we saw was a trial blackout, where five people have been electrocuted. ID announced this and Venezuela must know what's happening. And the head of Venezuela's National Assembly, Deostado Cabello, has responded after the arrest, arrest of two relatives of Venezuela's First Lady in Haiti last week. Cabello calls the detention an abduction. According to him, the two young men were singled out by U.S. authorities, which he added was not an isolated incident, but part of a coordinated effort to discredit the government. Followed the supposed arrest of these people as an arrest. In reality, it has been an airplane traveling to Haiti with six people and two were kidnapped. This is what I understand because of the procedure is totally irregular. How is it that an airplane involved with drug trafficking is returned to Venezuela immediately? How is it that other people were released immediately? They took two people. And what about the others that were on the same plane? The plane is here in Venezuela. In Venezuela. And still in Venezuela, UNASUR electoral monitors arrived in Caracas ahead of parliamentary elections. The mission was accompanied by the Secretary General of the regional body, Ernesto Sampa. The monitoring mission is made up of around 60 specialists and will be working together with Venezuela's National Electoral Council. Telesur Isabel Finbo is in Venezuela. She tells us about the campaign preparations. This state-owned hot chocolate shop is one of the nationalization initiatives of Venezuela's socialist government. A producer as well as trader, Cacao Venezuela employs hundreds of people. As national elections approach, many of its workers are also following national debates closely. I really like that what we are selling here is from Venezuela. We have our own production. People come a lot looking for our product. We need everything to stay as it is. Here they support us a lot, so for that reason we have to vote. Surrounded by state-owned enterprises, Plaza Bolivar is a social and political hub. Since campaigning officially began last week for the National Assembly elections, it has become one of the many meeting points for canvassing and showing a united front for the revolutionary process. The Venezuelan electoral system is considered to be one of the best in the world. And here in Plaza Bolivar, people have the chance to familiarize themselves with the system ahead of the vote. Now, people can come here and go through every single step of voting, from putting their thumbprint to selecting candidates. Now, the people behind me say that people have been pretty much constantly coming to try out the system and that they'll, we will be here until December 1st. Last month, thousands of Venezuelans took part in a nationwide voting simulation, an exercise designed both to help people feel comfortable in the voting process and to troubleshoot any issues that may arise in the fully automated system. With little over two weeks before the vote, the government is hoping for a majority in order to be able to continue with its social programs. By allowing Venezuelans to be familiar with the vote lists and exposing the system to multiple audits, the PESUV is committed to a fair process. 
But while President Nicolás Maduro has said that he will recognize the election result, the opposition has yet to confirm that they too will respect it. Isabel Fembo, Telesur, Caracas. Heading on to Argentina, where the presidential runoff is just four days away, the two candidates are giving their all to win the votes of the undecided. Front for Victory hopeful Daniel Scioli will end his campaign on Thursday at the Contemporary Museum of Mar del Plata, while Mauricio Macri from Cambiemos will do the same in Huamaca. Argentina is not, is not only f days away from its first ever presidential runoff, but rather at an historic junction. Either it chooses to keep the doors open to further social transformation in a democratic, popular and anti-imperialist uh, direction, or it will choose to close an era of reforms to go back to dependence and rising poverty induced by right-wing neoliberalism. Thousands of Argentines have taken to the streets of cities and towns to convince their fellow compatriots to vote for Daniel Scioli and in the most creative of ways. Telesur's correspondent in Argentina, Leo Poblete Coduti, has walked the streets of Buenos Aires to see firsthand what people have to say ahead of this weekend's elections. While Argentina's monopolized mainstream media echoes a strong anti-FPV campaign across the hundreds of radio, television, print and online services who to masses far and wide this country, utilizing tactics which range from subjective pro-Macri analysis and opinions to downright lying and manipulation, the anti-Macri sentiment has spilled onto the streets in the lead-up to this weekend's historical runoff. This is of enormous value, not only because it is spontaneous, but because it means a popular movement is not willing to give up its position on the streets. If a popular movement stays on the streets, the right has a complicated scenario because the prominence of the people on the streets always complicates the right. Activists which belong to the wide and diverse range of political parties which are backing the FPV have taken to the streets, handing out flyers at major intersections, at parks and even aboard public transport. But the mainstream media, both here and abroad, have chosen to hide this and it has been social media which has shown the creativity of those Argentines who are on the streets contesting the votes of those who are still undecided. Given the monopolized media's information blockade, the people have found ways to get the message through, very creative ways. We have tens of thousands of activities all over the country, such as the painting of murals, discussion groups, dialogues with intellectuals, city parks such as this one which become true open air forums of the people. We're talking to people in our workplaces, in the places we frequently go to, making homemade signs, continuously working in social media. We have many strategies that I think are very convincing. Monopolized mainstream media will not stop us. They will not be able to shut us up. Not only have political activists taken to the streets, thousands of citizens without an active participation in party politics have risen spontaneously far and wide Argentina to stop neoliberalism in its path to the presidential palace and seeks to differ itself from the hollow revolution of joy discourse which the neoliberal coalition preaches with its colourful balloons and catchy jingles. We are a group of workmates who organise fundraisers to get these posters printed, which we design collectively with the help of a mate who helped us with the final design of the poster. On social media and on the streets, the people, you can see it all around you, have taken this into their hands and we must work hard this week so we can carry on on the 22nd. Although the mainstream media is grossly creating the perception that Macri has won the election days before it's even held, it seems that the people of Argentina have realised that taking the streets to show its support to Daniel Scioli and the governing front for victory could very well be the key to breaking the deadlock and pushing Scioli, the only candidate capable of keeping the door open to socio-economic reform and stopping neoliberalism, into the presidency. Leo Politico Luti, Telesur, Buenos Aires. And we go to Brazil now where environmentalists have expressed their concern that the avalanche of mud and mining waste from two collapsed dams may have caused permanent damage to the region's ecosystem. The accident has already cut off drinking water for a quarter of a million people and saturated waterways downstream with a dense orange sediment. Scientists say that the sediment could alter the course of streams as it hardens 
reduce oxygen levels in the water and diminish the fertility of riverbanks and farmland. Like Kandonga, which formed behind a hydroelectric dam on the Rio Doce, has already mostly vanished on a thick layer of mud and shredded trees. The lake ha was used for fishing, but now most fish lay dead in the mud. Farmers are being forced to move their livestock away from the river's banks, afraid to let their cattle drink the water. When a problem like this happens, no one wants to take responsibility. But in addition to the mining companies, we also need to consider the responsibility of the environmental agencies, because the risk that these dams faced of collapsing had already been identified. But there are other dams that may also be at risk and are only now being assessed because of this catastrophe. And about 100 people demonstrated on Monday in Rio in front of one of the miners' headquarters. Activists smeared mud against the Vale logo, which is Brazil's largest miner and one of the country's biggest companies. With mud in their faces, protesters raised placards reading, It was not an accident, and shouted, Vale, you killed me. A member of the Asurini indigenous tribe said that he had put a curse on the company for it to become bankrupt. We now visit Peru, where different public sector workers are going on strike. This time, a strike and protest were called by workers in health services. Telesur's Ryan Mora is in Lima. He filed this report. Administrative workers from the public health care system of Peru, who are on strike, had prepared a protest in front of Congress on Tuesday, but their plans were frustrated by the police, who deployed a vehicle with water cannons to disperse the workers. Police also used batons to beat the workers and push them away from the area. They hit me. They showered me with a water cannon abusively. We were simply on the sidewalk protesting in support of formalizing the health sector administrative workers and general services. But they have beaten us too much. My hand is swollen, I'm injured, and I am soaked with dirty water. The main demand of the protesters is to formalize the 15,000 employees who are hired under a system for temporary workers with reduced benefits called CAS. We hope that the government solves this problem with our CAS colleagues. They've been earning $180, $210 or $240 a month for 14 years. And they're not considered in the formalization process of 2015 and 2016. We ask that the health team includes all administrative, maintenance, general services, nutrition, laundry, admission, and transportation workers. The healthcare workers are planning to continue protesting and are preparing to renew the strike next Monday, but this time the strike will continue without an unscheduled ending date, and they claim they will only stop when their demands are met. Rael Mora, Telesur, Peru. And in Mexico, teachers said that they will boycott the evaluations on the way from last weekend. More with Craig McGon. It was estimated that over 97% of Mexico's public school teachers participated in this past weekend's teacher evaluations in 25 of the country's 31 states uh, and the federal district. Or roughly 40,000 teachers, uh, according to official numbers from the National Education Secretary. Now, the evaluations were supposed to test teachers uh, on their skills and understanding of material, yet uh, in previous evaluations, uh, teachers have complained, claiming that the evaluation did not reflect the study materials as well as being excessive in its time. Now, uh, this evaluation comes after months and even years of very stiff opposition from the National Coordinator of Education Workers, or the CNTE, uh, the Independent Public Education Teachers Union that has rejected the evaluations and the so-called education reform that is behind the evaluations, claiming that they are part of a strategy to make more precarious the labor rights of public educators, educators as well as to privatize the education system. Uh, now, the recently appointed education uh, secretary, Aurelio Nuno, who was a former advisor in Mexico's president, Enrique Peña Nieto, uh, and considered to be one of the architects behind the controversial education reform, declared in a press conference this weekend that there is no room for the actions of protesting and dissident teachers of the CNTE and that the education reform will be implemented no matter their rejection. Now, we affirmed that those who oppose the reform and its evaluations will ultimately be punished for their actions. Now, the evaluation process is to, do, to be carried out uh, on through to mid-December. 
This is Clayton Khan reporting for Telesur here in Mexico City. Bolivia has announced an increase in gas exploration following reports of increased production. President Evo Morales spoke this Tuesday in a news conference at Repsol's Margarita Huacaya natural gas refinery, where he confirmed further investments to find 5 trillion cubic feet in the area. Repsol President Antonio Brufao announced that his refinery had increased its production to more than 19 million cubic meters per day of gas, surpassing expectations and is currently generating some 30% of the energy that Bolivia produces. He added that Bolivia's state company has also helped. And coming up after the break, the Palestinian Intifada, cont intifada continues. A special report next. Discover Latin America and the world in our programs. Telesur reports, The Real USA, the stories behind the tweets. Ataman, Lives, Know Your Body, Open Files. Exposing the conflicts that affect our people. Compelling personal stories and the most controversial events. See it all on telesurtv.net in English. Telesur, wherever the news, you'll be there. Day by day, they're in the street with one mission, change the world through their actions. This is a different type of program, a conversation. The perspective you won't find in traditional media can be found on The Laura Flanders Show. Watch it on telesurtv.net slash English. Telesur, wherever the news, you'll be there. We need to understand the world we live in. We require news with critical points of view, thorough analysis and social commitment. This information is vital to think, to understand and to change. The world demands a new perspective. Telesurtv.net forward slash English. Wherever the news, you'll be there. Welcome back. Russia has intensified its airstrikes on targets in Syria, most recently launching long-range bombers and cruise missiles. This as they continue the search for the perpetrators of the crash of the Russian airliner in Egypt. Thus far, the Kremlin has carried out some 2,300 sorties in Syria over the past 48 days against the self-named Islamic State group and other targets. The most recent airstrikes by French pilots in Syria dropped some 2,000 bombs in Raqqa. This as France's president, Francois Hollande, follows through with his promise to hit back at Daesh without mercy after last week's Paris attacks killed 129 locals and foreigners. And France's Eiffel Tower closed once more this time, reportedly because employees demanded greater security at the tourist site. There has been heightened security since last week. However, workers are requesting several evacuation points as well as more barriers at the entrance where visitors could be filtered in more efficiently. Jordan's King Abdullah believes that the threat posed by the self-proclaimed Islamic State or Daesh must be taken seriously. We are facing a third world war against humanity and this is what brings us all together this is a war as i've said repeatedly within islam and unfortunately over a hundred thousand muslims have been murdered by daesh alone uh, over the past two years and that doesn't also count for the atrocities that like-minded groups uh, have also done in africa and asia so therefore we must act uh, fast and holistically to tackle and respond to the interconnected threats, whether it is in this region, Africa, Asia, or in Europe. U.S. Speaker of the House Paul Ryan says that Daesh cannot be allowed to take advantage of the Western world's compassion. He said that a temporary pause was needed on the focus on the refugee crisis 
in light of the recent attacks in Paris. Ryan called on President Barack Obama to come up with a plan that definitively defeats Daesh. He added that the ultimate course of action needed to be taken to deal with the current refugee crisis is to defeat ISIS. And Daesh wants to launch harmful cyber attacks. That's according to British Finance Minister George Osborne. Osborne said that vigilance was required as ISIS is already using the internet for the purposes of propaganda, radicalization and operational planning. Britain is currently developing an offensive cyber capability to attack and counter terrorist hackers. An earthquake registering at 6.5 on the Richter scale shook Greece this week. The epicenter of the earthquake was located on Greece's western coasts, according to the U.S. Geological Survey. The depth of the, of the quake registered at 10 kilometers and was felt mostly in left Carter Island. There have been no reports of human casualties or damage to property. And Greece will now receive another portion of its $92 billion bailout deal from international lenders. Greek finance, finance minister Euclid Sakaloto said that the process was challenging. However, an agreement was, has been reached on a gambling tax and a possible wine consumption tax. There have been challenges over discussions on bank reforms as well as the protection for homeowners from repossession. However, it is believed that those challenges have been dealt with. We believe it was a tough negotiation. There was a great deal of pressure because of time constraints concerning the bank recapitalization. As you can understand, just as during the summer, the lever used to pressure us was a possible Greek exit. This time it was the bank recapitalization and this created a suffocating negotiating process for us. A coalition, a coalition of more than 60 organizations gathered in Washington, D.C. for three days of action against Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement in hopes that they will persuade Congress to not approve it. More on this now with Telesur's Bianca Perez. For hundreds of activists, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement represents the protection of large corporations and completely ignores the interests of the people. This idea brought dozens of organizations together to attempt to change the minds of congressmen. On November 5th, the, uh, the trade agreement was finally made public. And uh, some chapters were leaked earlier, but now we really know what's in this secret trade agreement with no, none of us people, ordinary citizens at the table, but corporate representatives at the table to write a trade agreement that protects their profits and their property some of the people who will see themselves most affected will be the agricultural sector in the United States. These citizens believe that like every other trade agreement in the past, the TPP will harm their industry instead of helping it prosper. We've been fighting these free trade agreements for decades and there's always the promise that it's supposed to be better for farmers, we'll have more exports, everybody will do better, but it's never worked. Small farmers continue to go out of business, big corporate farms come in, uh, the price and the quality of food goes up, so nobody really wins. Activists see the TPP as a way for the United States to exert their interests of big corporations and underdeveloped countries who will suffer the consequences of this agreement. Less food safety protections, less environmental protections, less health protections, uh, less access to medicine in, in this country. But the worst impacts will certainly be seen in the underdeveloped nations or the nations uh, around the world that are being taken over and dominated by the United States corporate imperialist model. The organizers of this action have planned for three days of protests in which they will attempt to close down the Chamber of Commerce as well as go to the embassies of the 11 different nations who are part of this agreement. Bianca Perez, Telesur, Washington, D.C. The Palestinian Authority has filed yet another complaint with the International Criminal Court. This time it's about Israel's plans to construct 454 homes in two settlements in East Jerusalem. Palestinian Foreign Minister Riyad al-Malki said that settlement building in parts of the West Bank annexed by Israel back in 1967 is illegal. He said that his office is, quote, working on documenting and sending what is required regarding the latest developments and Israeli escalation, which reaches the land and the Palestinian humans in various ways, end quote. Meanwhile, clashes between Palestinians and Israeli forces continue. To describe the latest developments, there, here is Telesurus Noharazim.
Media outlets reported on Monday that 41 Palestinians were shot and injured in violent clashes that erupted between outraged protesters and Israeli security forces north of the West Bank. 31 Palestinians, including two journalists, were shot and injured in Al Balu area in Al Biri city in clashes that erupted after the occupation forces dispersed a march by firing tear gas bombs and rubble coasted steel bullets at Palestinian protesters. The protesters answered back by throwing stones and Molotov cocktails at their vehicles, which then pursued the protesters while opening heavy fire at them. The Palestinian Intifada continues for the second month in a row. It's escalating and developing, especially after a heroic operation was carried out by Shadi Matwea from Hebron last Friday. So the Intifada is continuing, developing, escalating and extending in more than a geographic spot. All of this reflects the keenness of the Palestinian people to resume their struggle until they achieve their goals. Meanwhile, Israeli forces shot and injured 11 Palestinians with live ammunition in violent clashes at Qalandia checkpoint north of the West Bank, following the funeral of two Palestinians who were killed by Israeli fire the night before. The murder of these two Palestinians happened as a large number of Israeli troops stormed Qalandia refugees' camps to demolish Palestinian prisoners' home. Palestinian media sources said that gunmen exchanged fire with the Israeli forces for more than 10 minutes during the clashes at the checkpoint. Nur Harazin, Telesu TV, Gaza. And now here's a brief look at other major stories around the world. Macedonia is joining the growing list of European countries that are erecting wire fences on its borders after Hungary started the trend of disallowing the entrance of refugees into its country. However, Macedonia says that the fence it will erect will not bar refugees but limit the numbers entering. People are dying every day from explosives as a tense environment continues in eastern Ukraine. Soldiers have begun teaching children in school how to recognize and avoid landmines and other explosives. Bombs have even been planted in toys. People are constantly being blown up by mines. Anti-tank mines are used, but very rarely. These are mostly grenades. The easiest thing is the remote hand grenade, which is placed on the booby trap which people don't notice and then it explodes. Even soldiers might not notice it and get blown up. This is the easiest thing. And Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras, as well as thousands of Greek citizens, paid homage to the victims of the student uprising against the military dictatorship back in 1973. Freedom, bread and education was the student's slogan during the uprising. Rwanda's national cycling team is getting ready to perform in the Tour du Rwanda that begins this week. The team is optimistic about the upcoming race after having trained extensively at the training centre called the Africa Rising Cycling Centre. It was opened back in June 2014. The centre was opened by Jonathan Boyer, who was the first US cyclist to ride in the competition. He is also the driving force behind the Rwanda team. On the sixth day after Diwali, the ancient festival of Shath Puja is celebrated. This is the most important festival of the year for people, mostly from the states of Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. This video here is in Bihar, where devotees of the Hindu sun god for four days will perform different ceremonies with hopes that all their wishes will come true. And finally this evening, in New York, the Christie's Auction House is offering over 280 works by renowned Latin American artists for sale. Works by artists such as Rufino Tamayo, Fernando Botero, Diego Rivera and Torres Garcia are now available, some of which are so valuable they are expected to go for millions of dollars. And there is much more on these and other stories on our website, telesurtv.net slash English. And of course, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as well. From our news teams in Quito, Ecuador, and right here in Caracas, Venezuela, my name is Regan Veens. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a great night.